Thank you very much, President Gu, for that very informative speech. Uh, next, we would like to welcome Minister Audrey Tang, Executive Yuan, Taiwan, who will present on the topic of how Taiwan achieves SDGs together. Thank you. Thank you. It's really an honor to uh, share some thoughts around the SDGs with you. Uh, and just a really quick photo, uh, this is my office. Uh, it's in the Taiwan Social Innovation Lab uh, in the central Taipei city, just next to the Jianguo Flower Market and the Dian Park. And pictured here is the, um, I think, uh, the mayor of Prague of uh, the Czech Republic, uh, who loves pangolins, apparently. Uh, we just learned that they're forming a sister city, who is Taipei, in a couple months. Uh, and it's uh, his cabinet, his small cabinet of people, and they each picked the uh, SDG corresponding to their work, uh, and they were just climbing uh, on my office. And they are the first uh, team anywhere in the world to climb on this, but then afterward it became fashionable, and so people uh, learned after the mayor of Prague uh, to just climb with the SDGs logos. It's now the very famous points uh, to check in on Facebook and social media. Um, and anyway, this is literally my office. So everybody can uh, just step right from the street because we tore down the walls uh, and talk to me for 40 minutes uh, at a time. Every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. I'm there uh, sharing food, sharing music uh, with people and this is also an incubating space. We work very closely with the USR projects nearby this space to co-create emergent social innovations to figure out the social norms together. So um, I will then share with you some um, experiences that I had working with universities uh, in order to further the SDG. So we're talking very broad brushes, uh, but uh, all of this can be uh, found online because everybody who work with me and uh, have any of the meetings that I chair, actually all the uh, transcript is published online. So you can see as the digital ministry in the past three years, I've uh, talked with 4,000 people on over 200,000 speeches in over 1,000 meetings each and every uh, conversation. For example, when I visited Zhuo Longgong University uh, in Thailand and so on, I had a conversation with the Zhuo Longgong staff. Uh, the entire transcript is, is online uh, for further study and so on. So the first case I'd like to present is the self-driving vehicles. Uh, and uh, just a couple years ago, when I first set up office hour, uh, there's just random people from MIT Media Lab who suddenly showed up one day with these very alien-looking um, creatures and said, these are self-driving tricycles and ministry, would you like to ride on one? And I'm like, is it safe? And they're like, it bumps into walls all the time. And I'm like, are you trying to do something to me? <laughs> and they're like, no, this is really slow. This is slower than a person running. And so it's very safe. Even if they run into walls, nobody gets hurt. And like, what's the kind of um, model of sustainability of operation? What's, is it in the proof of concept mode? They're like, we have no idea what we're trying to do with it. We want to figure it out together with the society. And this is a very different way uh, when we go about technological innovation. Here we call it the norm-based innovation model, where we have the norm interact with the market first before having the code and the law joining um, in a more top-down fashion. And so when they proposed these kind of self-driving tricycles, we literally interacted with the market. There was a Jianguo flower market nearby, and people just bought some uh, pots of flowers and so on, orchid flowers and so on. I remember an elderly couple just walks by because the wall is tore down. They just walked from the market to the social innovation lab, and they say, Minister, what do you do with those shopping baskets, with those trolleys, with those shopping carts? I'm like, these are not shopping carts, these are self-driving tricycles. You can step on one, you tell it where you want to go, and it drives there. And they're like, we don't want to be driven places. We want technology to be brought to us, to follow us, because as they were shopping in the flower market, they want these shopping baskets to stay close. They shop, they put into their hand free shopping, shop even more, and it's full, and they hear on the television that self driving vehicles can form a fleet. And so the full cars can stay there, summon an empty one uh, to form a fleet, and they keep shopping and keep placing into it, and isn't that nice? Well, it turns out it's not designed to do that. <laughs> but because it's open source and open hardware and open data, we work with the Taipei Tech people nearby in a very nice attempt of uh, university um, integration with the market and the norms. We co-created the new design so that it has two eyes, it can follow people around, it can blink, it can understand hand gestures, and most importantly, uh, it can fit what the society expects out of uh, self-driving vehicles. And of course, using the experiment 
results we had with this one year sandbox, we now have issued the testing place for self-driving buses, um, type of city, self-driving ships and boats uh, in the Kaohsiung uh, River and so on. But the important thing is that if you start with the norm and the market, you can encourage effective partnership without getting limited by the vision of the regulator. The entire society can co-create. And so for many prototype uh, pilots like this, the main issue is not when it's in incubation stage, it's actually when it's in the acceleration stage, in that there's often no political will to scale the social innovation to the entirety of the country. Well, it turns out that we have the design called presidential hackathon, where every year, every April to July, everybody can propose such a good idea that transformed the society, and every year the president gives out five trophies. And one of the teams last year called Water Savior, again, partnered with the National Zhengzhou University um, to work with these repairs people in the Jilong region. It took um, three months to build a chatbot that helps them to diagnose the leaking points of the water pipes. It used to take two months uh, for a leak to appear before it's detected, but now it's just two days uh, using this chatbot. So it's a really good idea. And there's also uh, people from the offshore island, like the Green Island, who work on the telemedicine to enable the local nurses to do medical treatments with the help of the broadband connected specialized doctor from the Taiwan main island and so on. So these are all really good ideas and they get a trophy from the president. The trophy looks something like this. There is no prize money, but there is a micro projector uh, that's the base of the trophy. And if you turn it on, it projects the image of the president handing the trophy to the team. So it's a self-descriptive trophy, uh, and uh, it's very meta, uh, but it's very useful if you're in the public sector. If your director general say, well, your prototype in Geelong is great, but we don't have the budget to scale it to the entire country, you just summon the president, and then uh, they have the budget to scale it to the entire country. Or if the Minister of Health says, oh, your telemedicine is excellent, but it actually breaks the law, we will have to send a law amendment, and the helicopters are owned by the Ministry of Interior. It's cross-ministerial, cross-silo communication, very high uh, cost, and you just summon the president, and then they go and have a meeting. Because this is a promise from the president and the cabinet that whatever you prototype in the past three months, we will make it into national public policy within the next 12 months. And so this political will is the actual award, and we deliver five out of the five of the previous year. And so this year there's a record number of people entering to form data collaboratives. For each uh, incoming team, we coach them to form collaboratives that are trisectoral, meaning that at least one public servant, at least one academic or social sector, and at least one private sector entrepreneur in the team, so that it can be sustainable with the input of the entire society that enhances the mutual trust and with reliable data availability. One of the teams that entered this year is the Airbox team. Airbox is a really good uh, example of how even basic education teachers can engage in social responsibility. Uh, the uh, 2,000 or so measurement points here are measuring the PM 2.5, that is to say, uh, the air quality in Taiwan, and each of them is funded by just local volunteers, the basic education uh, teachers that uses these very cheap, like less than 100 euros, uh, air boxes uh, as a tool to teach students what does it mean as data stewardship, what does it mean to earn some data, to answer for requests of data, what does it mean for data quality. And so when more than 2,000 measurement points form a data coalition called Airbox, they have massive bargaining power compared to the environment ministry because at the time the environment ministry only have 87 measurement points and the civil society has 2000 and of course people are trusting the social sector's number because they're closer to us uh, than the environment ministry's number and in taiwan because we were a completely free and open jurisdiction we say we cannot beat them we must join them so we negotiate with the data coalition who said oh we would allow the environment ministry uh, to join our program using the CIVO IoT program, but we want you to set up our air boxes using our protocol, joining in our distributed ledgers in these places, which are industrial parks or industrial areas. And these are private property, so they cannot break and enter and, and install them. But it turns out that we own the land. 
in the industrial parks. And so uh, we can put their airbags on the lamps and completing the picture of what it means uh, for people to measure the air quality together. And people can trust each other because of distributed ledgers that people cannot modify each other's numbers. That's the blockchain property. And so this is open source and open hardware. We have people around the world just downloading the software and building Raspberry Pi or Arduino, uh, the open hardware that joins the Taiwan initiated uh, airbox. And this year, they just entered with the idea of what they call water box that does the same, uh, but actually uh, just measures water quality in agri-clans so that when the industrial manufacturers on agri land pollute the waterways, uh, the Ministry of Economy can directly cut the electricity uh, and cut the uh, water supply for those polluting uh, industrial plants. And they, of course, always say, no, it's the upstream that's polluting, it's not us. Well, then they are motivated to buy some water boxes uh, and then install it in their waterways. So how do we make sure that the entire society is okay with those new ideas that transforms the society and each one has to correspond to a specific sustainable development target? Well, we use a new voting method and this is the last social innovation I would like to uh, share with you in this talk. The quadratic voting is a new application of economic theory when it comes to social choice. In Taiwan, we have a national uh, participation platform called join.gov.tw and the join platform has more than 10 million unique visitors. Considering Taiwan is 23 million people, it's a lot of people. And each of these visitors gets 99 points that can be spent on more than 130 projects. And when you really like this idea, you can vote one vote, and that will cost you one point. Or if you really look uh, like this idea, for example, using machine learning uh, to detect marine debris uh, on the uh, on the ocean before it hits the shores. It's a really good idea. Yeah, you like to give it two votes and that's going to cost you four points and so on. And so it's quadratic and ensure that the increasing uh, amount of votes, the marginal cost is the same as the marginal return. So it's quadratic. And because of that, if you really like some idea, maybe you will vote nine votes to it. But still, you cannot vote 10 because everybody have uh, like nine. Right? So you, you still have 18, and nobody wants to squander their votes. So they will look into something else and say, oh, this is what's maybe four points. And then you still have two. And then you're motivated to learn about two more sustainable goals. For example, to combat illicit financial flow, like Panama Paper, somebody builds a AI to detect uh, illicit financial flow and show companies entirely um, private data and uh, sorry, public data, and they predicts really well. And so it's certainly worth more than one. So maybe people look at what they voted and they think, actually, this is worth more. And so they would take some votes out of this one. And maybe they do a seven and seven. And so what this does is that using mechanism design, we encourage people to learn far more about sustainable development than if they are mobilized to uh, vote on one project only. And the end result is that everybody who voted, which is on average five or six projects, all of them feel that they have won when the top 20 gets announced, gets incubated. Uh, because if you only vote for one, likely half of the people will feel they have lost. That's what we see in national uh, elections and referendums. But if people uh, express their social choice, their pri private personal social choice, in a way that contributes to the global understanding of the global goals, then everybody wins. And so whenever we have a quadratic voting like this, it always ends in this kind of selection that makes everybody uh, a little bit happier and that everybody can learn that actually there's only a few divisive statements that divide the society. There's only a few issues that people genuinely feel an ideological split or ideological difference. Otherwise, people can see through this visualization platform called Polis that actually most of their friends and families feel similar when it comes to public choices of what to do. And that is what sustainable development goals means. It means that it re re reinforces the idea that the economic, the social, and the um, environment, social, and the business sectors all uh, work on each other's uh, bottom lines. But if you look at a 10-year, uh, 20-year horizon, we actually reinforce each other. And so this is a real case that we helped in Bowling Green, uh, Kentucky, USA. Everybody there using this way, new way of voting uh, thought the arts are important. What we had was science, technology, uh, engineering, mathematics, but actually it's not enough. The art teachers feel that it should be STEAM because the art uh, guides the inspiration 
for the uh, for the STEM education. And so what we're seeing here is that something, no matter whether they identify as Republican or Democrats, all agree, and the mayor can just implement this. And this is the role of uh, higher education to work as a kind of uh, brain trust, a think tank for the local population to figure out what people truly want uh, without uh, being derided or um, distracted by the institutional and social media that over focuses on the divisive statements and reinforces the idea of a polity instead of a, of a divisiveness. And so as a final um, conclusion, I would like to share with you um, my job description. Three years ago when I became digital minister, the HR people asked me uh, to write a job description uh, to uh, explain what kind of innovation can join the social business, environmental, and governance powers together. And I'm like, okay, uh, there's a new thing called the, the Sustainable Goals that was just announced in 2015, agreed by everybody uh, on the planet. And so my work is just 1718, reliable data, 1717, effective partnership, and 176, open innovation. And they're like, Minister, nobody memorized those numbers by, by head. Uh, you have to write something in plain language so that people have some intuition of those sustainable targets. And so I just write a poem, uh, a prayer, which is my uh, job description. I'll read it to you now. Well, we see the Internet of Things. Let's make it an Internet of Beings. Well, we see virtual reality. Let's make it a shared reality. Or we see machine learning. Let's make it collaborative learning. Or we see user experience. Let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you very much. I was saying that there's not enough time, but uh, President Gu was saying, you know, two minutes. So I'll keep it to two minutes then. Uh, pro projector, please. Would you like to switch to my iPad? Um, okay, and, and I'll, I guess I'll stand up. Right. Um, I really learned a lot uh, from all of your um, contributions and stories. Uh, and if you remember, at the very beginning, um, President Gu asked a question because uh, I dropped out of junior high school when I was 15 years old. Um, what can university do to me? Uh, and how, what does higher education uh, work in the, for a uh, homeschooler? And I would like to take two minutes to briefly answer that question. Uh, the reason I dropped out of junior high school is because I discovered a website back then and it's called Archive, and it's still around, which is amazing, um, considering it's one of the very few uh, websites that was around in the very beginning of the Wild Web. <laughs> That's your alma mater, <laughs> Cornell, <laughs> yes. Um, and so Cornell really um, contributed to social responsibility by allowing anyone with a dial-up internet at the time, because I'm interested in uh, computer science, to have the latest access to all the preprints using open access. There was n no word of open access back then, uh, just a preprint server so that people can uh, post their pre peer review uh, journal articles uh, for people to write uh, feedback on. And so I just took a look at quite a few papers there. I made my science fair project uh, working on computational linguistics, and I started writing uh, to the papers that I cite. And none of the professors uh, know that I'm only 14 years old or 15 years old, and so they all wrote back. And so we started contributing uh, to science together. And so I went to my principal at the time, uh, Principal Du Hui Ping, and she said, okay, um, I." Even you won the science fair, you would have a guarantee spot in a top senior high uh, school. You still have to study uh, for and get a GRE, a good score, and maybe you can uh, participate in a postdoc uh, position uh, in your favorite professor's lab. And I told the principal, the professor just wrote back, and we're actually uh, working on science together already. So what is the point of senior high school education? And she uh, looked at the email printouts, looked at the archive.org, which is very new to her at the time, and she thought for one minute. It. And then she said, tomorrow on, you don't have to go to school anymore. <laughs> and so I dropped out with the full blessing of my uh, teachers and, and the principal. And then, of course, I learned uh, bioinformatics from bioarchive, psychology from psychology archive, um, legal uh, theory from the law archive, and all the preprint open access service. And so, to my mind, all these are like constellations. Um, 
you know, in the sky, in the night sky. Uh, they represent uh, the humanity's collective history of organizing knowledge in ways that are understandable in each culture and each traditions. And each culture may indeed have different names of constellations. But for me, someone who really wants to understand why people trust each other so quickly on the internet, swift trust, why people start hating on each other so quickly on the internet, swift hate, um, this kind of um, constellation is only useful to me if they are offered in an open access format so that I can form my own constellation out of existing stars in the night sky regardless of which majors, which departments or which archives, preprint service they are hosted on. And so this cross-disciplinary research um, path, I think, guides uh, my vision of a purely horizontal leadership that leads to the plurality. And so it's obvious that the plurality is in full force here, <laughs> that all of us understand the idea of co-creation with the community. And so I would like to um, highlight two things. The first is that I'm still contributing back to science. <laughs> uh, and so uh, all my uh, work is actually published still on social archive. So even though I'm not uh, ostensibly having a university degree, I think uh, by democratizing academia, <laughs> everybody should be able to contribute to open access and to open science and that's the first thing I'd like to uh, say. And the second thing is that plurality is only the beginning. It is just us respecting the different cultures. But the highest form of freedom is to be able to migrate to a different culture, from the culture of academia to the culture of the local community, from the culture, like in Taiwan, of the eastern side of indigenous nations, the Austronesian culture, to the more westernized, uh, western side of the culture. The ability to travel through cultures, to see uh, people's uh, stories with a different set of eyes liberates us from our original cultures and re imbues the meaning of sustainable development, which is after a global affair. And so I'd like to share with you one small poem that I just composed last week that talks about this. It goes like this. Whirling ocean and beautiful islands, let's make a transcultural republic of citizens. Thank you so much. Oh, and Tom can help. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, we would now like to present a graph of appreciation to today's participating universities. We would like to invite the universities to come up one at a time. Yes. Okay, I would like to, you know, add one sentence. Uh, when I say, as a tradition, this evening I'm going to drink as much as I could. That's with the permission of my wife. <laughs> so you, you guys have to thank her for allowing me to do this, okay? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, we would like to invite the universities to come up one at a time to be presented with their plaque of appreciation. <laughs> 